Welcome back to The Agent Goldmine. Here is what to expect to learn in today's show. What it's like working at Redfin as a showing agent and then working up into a lead agent. What questions to ask if you're considering joining a 50-50 team. When to know you're ready to break off from that team and become a solo agent on your own. Plus, stick around to the end for a step-by-step breakdown of getting that buyer broker signed. Today, we have Kendra Haro, who is a real estate agent in the Tucson area. She's actually my neighbor. We've done transactions together, and she is a cool-ass person. She's She has over six years of experience and over 150 closings, and she's worn many hats. She started like hustling as a salaried realtor at a major discount brokerage to now recently just becoming a solo agent because... She was finding all these clients on her own and she didn't want to have to pay a 50-50 team split. So while she calls the vibrant Tucson area home, her heart has a special connection in Hawaii, don't we all? (laughs) And she she actually goes there pretty often. So she's, she's, I don't know, living the life, like slinging homes and vacationing in Hawaii. So again, she recently, recently became a solo agent after leaving a team. And we talk about her transition, the questions to ask a brokerage if you are considering a team. So without further ado, bring on Kendra Haro and give her a follow on Instagram. It's Kendra Haro underscore. This is The Agent Goldmine, where you'll find real talk, shit talk, and ambition. We're here to build real businesses and be more than your average agent. We want to know what the killers are actually doing within their businesses, the reality of it. All tactical, no fluff. So we're here to find out. Please share and enjoy. Kendra Haro, welcome to our podcast, The Agent Goldmine, where you're going to have the best time of your life. We've already done our introduction, so the audience already knows you a little bit. You recently switched brokerages. Why the switch and what's the setup like now? Okay, so yeah, I recently switched brokerages. Well, I was at a discount, a big discount brokerage first. And so that was like a big leap to go from a discount brokerage to then a team. And so then I was on a team. So I just left the team and now I'm solo. And so from leaving the team from solo, I just felt like really why I left the discount brokerage in the first place was to build my brand and my business for myself. So that was kind of the ultimate decision in terms of being a solo agent. I chose the team first because I thought that'd be a good stepping stone going from giving handed all your leads to then being completely on your own. So I was like, let me join the team. And so that's kind of like the middle ground. And then eventually go out on my own. So that's where I am now is on my own. And I'm really excited would you, about that. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> would you would you recommend that stepping stone, like that order, that process to others? Or or is there anything that you would change? No, I think I would still recommend that. And I know we're going to talk about working at the discount brokerage, but doing that was, a, a, there was a lot of lessons in that. And then the team part of it, I don't regret that. I think just my only piece of advice for that is the reason I was doing that was to get leads as well. Like I knew I was going to have some leads, but I also wanted to be fed some leads. And so you just need to really make sure you research the team. And if they're, if that's the reason you're going, then make sure that their source and streams of leads are really there and that they're really going to give those to you. Okay, let's, can we break it down one by one? This is really exciting. I've never worked at a discount brokerage. So where did you work? And you mentioned them like giving you red hot leads. Can you tell us what was it like to work? Where did you work and what was it like to work there? Yeah, so I started my real estate career with Redfin. So I started at Redfin as a showing agent. And so what that means is you have to have your license and you're basically just an assistant to the lead agents showing, like showing. So you're just opening doors. So I would get, I was a 10, uh, I was a 1090 but I was just paid basically per door. So, you know, when you're a Redfin agent, you have heavy loads. So you cannot be showing homes to people all the time. And Redfin's website is built to, you know, show a home. If you see it, it says click here and go see the home. So you needed somebody like me who was a showing agent to go out and do all that. So I started doing that. I did that for about eight months and then they turned me into a lead agent. That's where, you know, you're doing the deals, you're meeting the, those are your clients. Those are, you know, you're doing all that paperwork, et cetera. Okay. For the showing agent, how much do they pay you for doors or per door? And what was their training like? 
to set you up to go show homes. So back then per door, you know, I think it started at 30 and then $30 for the tour. And then, you know, as you added homes, they would add like 10 to $15, depending on if it was a weekday or a weekend and the time, things like that. So that's kind of how they did that part of it. The training was a lot of online training, like videos and stuff like that. And then they just kind of threw you into that. But to be honest, if you're an agent and you're like, you just started and you're scared and you're like, I don't want all this responsibility that comes with being an agent. Being a showing agent was one of the best things I ever did. And that's how I learned. And so because a lot of times you also had to go in the field and shadow a couple of times with your lead agent. And so just sitting there and watching them and soaking all that in, you're you're learning all that. And you're getting the practice of building those relationships with clients without having all that responsibility of the negotiations, the deals, you know, things fall apart, whatever. That's not your fault. You're just there to open the door pretty much. <laughs> okay. So you did your Redfin time. And then at that point, so you started, so you were a real estate agent. You graduated from being a showing agent, real estate agent working on your own clients. And at that point you just, you transitioned to a team. What was that like? What, what were you looking to get out of the team? So when I transitioned to the team aspect of it, I was really looking for at Redfin. I was used to having people around me. They're not on my team per se, but they were there and we had meetings and we, you know, they were helping, we were helping each other, things like that. And so what I didn't want to do is just completely leave that because I feed off of other people's success. Like I'm very competitive. I compete with myself, obviously, but I like that push. I need that push, that motivation. So I was looking for something like that in a, in a team. And I didn't want to go to a big team. I wanted to go to a smaller team. So that was like the number one thing. And then the second thing was uh, the leads, obviously. Like I was a little scared to just go out into the middle of nowhere by myself. So the team was like, okay, that would be a good way to get some leads. So I can also work my business and have some leads from their business as well. So that was the reason for choosing the team. Okay. In real quick on the Redfin, what did your split splits look like there? And what did your splits look like on the team? So Redfin, you don't have splits. Redfin, you're on a salary. You're a salaried agent in Redfin. You even don't when, get paid commissions. Because in the beginning, you were the showing agent. Even when you were the Correct. lead agent, you were still salary. That's yeah. Not, so when you were showing it, I know much. everybody asks That's me so all these questions. <laughs> so when you're a showing agent, you're like an independent contractor, just like you are a real estate agent. They pay you per door, per inspection, whatever. As a lead agent, you're a salaried agent for them. W-2 employee. That's what you are when you're a lead agent. So you get a base salary, which it's not very much. And then you get bonuses for every time you close a home. And then they offer you benefits as well. That's kind of how that works. And for the, and then when you were on the team, what did that look like? Team was, so I was very hesitant on it, but I decided to do it. Team was 50, 50, regardless of where the lead came from. So it was my lead team's lead. It was 50, 50 until a certain amount. I think it was like 2 million, two or 3 million. And then it turned to 60, 60, 40. And then after 5 million, it was 70, 30. And you could never get more than 70. So that's kind of how that team split worked. Okay. Got it on the split. So you mentioned the team, you didn't want to go completely on your own and leave people or the competition, but you also mentioned leads. And then before, I think you mentioned, be careful of asking the questions about where those leads are coming from, their sources. Could you elaborate on that? Or did I mishear you? Yeah, no, I just mean you have, you need to really ask the questions. I think it's partly my fault too. I didn't really dive into where those leads are coming from and how frequently, like I wasn't asking those questions. So the issue that I had and why one of the big reasons I left the team was I closed a certain amount of deals and I was 95% of the closed deals were my leads. So I'm paying 50, 50 to the team. And I'm not really gaining what I was looking for financially. The numbers weren't making sense anymore. So that's what I mean. Make sure you really ask those questions because that's on me for not asking those questions to make sure that it's going to be worth what you think it's going to be worth. Thank you for listening. Out of respect for your time, we want to make this show as valuable as possible for you. So if you have any feedback on how we can improve, please let us know. DM us at Ali the Agent and The Shelby Show. Are there any other questions that, that you would, looking back now that you would advise other agents that are considering joining teams, 
similar to that, what other questions should agents be asking before they join a team? I think that they should be asking what kind of systems that are offered as well and how their process really works. Because typically teams want you to do things a certain way. And if you're used to doing things another way, it can be a really big transition. For me, I'm very stubborn and I like things my own way. I don't like change. I like to do them the way I want to do them. So that it, that was a big transition for me too, because you know they want you know, they have a certain person that they want you to send your paperwork to, or they want a person that they want you to schedule things for you, things like that. So it creates tension that should, that could have been prevented if I would have asked for those things in the beginning and knew that up front. And so I just think that you really need to make sure that the team aligns with what you're doing. Unless you're a brand new agent, you may not even know what that looks like. But if you've been doing it, you definitely want to ask those questions, especially if you're stubborn like me. <laughs> How long were you at the team? I did it for a year. I, I stuck with it for a year. And then I was like, okay. And I the team was, was great. One... The team was great. It just, it just yeah. didn't make sense anymore. It's a business decision. Yeah. Yeah. And, and at that point, the, the broker owners, the team leaders, they know, right? Like they know, and they should want what's best for the agent as well. There's, there's, Yeah. I remember that one time I was being recruited to a company and they're like, our culture, they were like speaking up this culture. <laughs> and I walked into their office and it was like the most awkward thing. Everyone just, no one was really talking to each other. And I had to walk through the bullpen. First of all, there's a bullpen. I already don't like that. First of all, there's an office. I already don't like that, you know? <laughs> so I'm like walking through the bullpen. Everyone's just like staring at me. I felt like the new girl in school, you know, I, I've never had that feeling before. But if I were to ever have been the new girl, I would have felt like that, I'm sure. I was like, yeah, this is not it. I just feel like team leaders, people that are recruiting, you can't say, you can't speak up the culture and then have it be the complete opposite. I just went on a huge tangent. Okay, so since then, you're now a solo agent. You're now a oh, solo agent. Hold on. Oh, I want to add yeah. something in this. What's his name? To fix it. <laughs> But I wanted to add in there too. The other thing that I would ask about a team, because this, this is important, you need to ask how they do, how they do trainings for agents, because what happens a lot of times and what I, I experience is they recruit really top notch agents who know what they're doing. Like they've been in it for a few years. They're very savvy. They know, you, you know, you're looking for more of different kind of training versus bringing in a brand new agent. And then you're, you're doing like, I call it baby training, like how to do contracts, how to talk to people, how to run a buyer consultation, things like that. And so you've got these mix of agents that those trainings don't work well together. And if it's a smaller team, you can't split that. It's hard to split that time. So what happens is you've got this seasoned agent and you've got a new agent and you're sitting in this buyer broker consultation that you're just like, what, what am I doing here? This is not, I need to be learning different things. So that, that I think that's a big question too, to ask like how they're recruiting and how they do that kind of training, who they're recruiting. So you bring up a really, really good point. There are a lot of smaller or even medium mid-sized teams where the seasoned agents are like kind of being forced to go to these trainings that are 101 because they're recruiting, they're getting like these newer agents. And then it's, that's also another element as to why seasoned producing agents end up leaving teams, small teams, mid teams. So, okay. So you realize that 95% of what you were closing were your own self-generated leads anyway. So now you are solo. What is, you typically work with buyers, right? Uh, what is your niche? What, what is your process? And then I want to get into the golden nugget. And wait, real quick okay. before you do that, can you tell us what brokerage you're at? Because I feel like listeners at this point are like, oh, she definitely joined Five Pillars Nation. But this is the first day I'm meeting you. So what brokerage are you at? And then, sorry, so, all of Ali's question. Okay. Yeah. So no, I actually joined, I'm in Tucson. And so I joined a boutique brokerage. It's called Limitless Real Estate. And it's based out of Queen Creek in the East Valley of Phoenix. So it's a little different because I'm in Tucson and it's about an hour, 10 minutes away. But I chose them because I followed a lot of their social media, their Instagram. I was connecting with a lot of their agents and I just saw what they were accomplishing over there and I had to be a part of it. So kind of went over there. I was excited. And then for Allie's question. So Allie, can you, I'm sorry, can you ask those things? What's your, yeah. Okay. So majority of your leads, I hit you with 32 questions. So I get it. 
Uh, majority of your leads were your own. How, where were you finding these leads? What type of like avatar? What is your avatar? So my niche is probably, I would say, repeat buyers. Honestly, I do a lot of first time home buyer, but it's more so repeat people. And my business is really coming from a sphere of influence, just clients that I have worked in the past from other places and, you know, doing their deals and then, you know, word of mouth because they're referring me to friends and family. That's the biggest, that's my pie right there is just the past deals and them referring people. And then second would be, I think social media from like my hometown in Benson, I serve them. So I've been doing a lot of social media there and being staying on top of mind over there. And they seem to be calling a lot more. So I know the social media is working. So your golden nugget is related to this, right? I think this is a good transition to the, to what you brought for the audience, which the whole everyone can find on theagentgoldmine.com for free. Kendra, thank you for bringing your golden nugget. Can you talk us through it? Yeah, so my golden nugget that I had put together was basically talking about what everybody's talking about right now is the NAR lawsuit and then how to get buyer broker agreements because that seems to be the biggest issue about everything. And I have a lot of agents who tell me, you know, I've never had a buyer broker side and they're not very comfortable with it. And so one thing that I had a lot of practice in from being on the team, I'll give them credit for that, is it really pushed the buyer broker agreement. So I'm very comfortable with those. So I've been teaching agents to how to do those. And I think it's really important for to get a buyer broker sign. I think your best opportunity to get that sign is during a buyer consultation, because that's where you're showing your value proposition, because it's no longer just, hey, I want to see a house, you take them out and look and hope you're going to get paid for the co-op, right? It should have never been that way in, in, in the first place. I don't understand why it was practiced like that. I was taught like that, but then I was retaught to get the buyer broker because, you know, when you get a listing, you sign a listing agreement. When you get a buyer, you should be getting a buyer broker agreement. And I think a lot of that focus of that too was agents were really scared to do that because they think they're going to scare their clients off by saying, hey, we're working together. But I think that buyer consultation is the exact opposite of what I find. I find when I do those and I'm explaining what I'm doing for them and I very clearly lay out how agents get paid and you give them the buyer broker, they don't even think twice about it. Most, I would say 99% of the time, they don't think twice. We are, I still get in my head and I'm like, oh, let's see how this is going to go. We're more in our head than they are. And so that's just where that, and that's what I put in my golden nugget too, like be confident because they can read that off you. So if you're very confident about what you're speaking and you're like, hey, I have this agreement, you know, this is how this works. Yeah, they don't even think twice. One percent of the time you're going to get that pushback from people and you're going to read it on their face and they're going to be like, I don't really know about that. I, I don't really I just met you. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I kind of like you. But so that's where my golden nugget comes in, too, is I offer like. I get it. We just met. We, you know, we've only been in here for 45 minutes. You're still not comfortable agreeing to this amount with me. Cool. That's cool. You want to go see some houses? Let's go for one day. And I'll have them sign a buyer broker for one day. And then that way you go out there and now you get to show them who you are as well. Not only did you show them in your buyer consultation, but then you're in the field and you get to show them what you do. And then at that point, I've never had someone not sign it. Could you talk us through, we're at the buyer consultation and you are giving your, pre can you talk through like how you actually say it to a client? So that way listeners can just literally copy what you do. What does the buyer consultation look like? Basically walk us through if you would. Yeah. So buyer consultation, I start talking about them. Well, I lie. I, I started by telling them what they're going to expect, right? I don't want them to feel like they're going to be in here for two hours. So I lay out exactly what I'm going to do. I say, hey, I'm going to talk a little bit. We're going to talk about you. I want you to tell me what we're doing here. Let's talk about what you what your needs, wants are, et cetera. When you're done, I also want to explain the process, how we work. And then I throw in how we are hired, how we are compensated. And so when I'm going through the buyer consultation, it also depends on levels, right? If they're a first time home buyer, they're not a first time home buyer. Like you have to tweak it to whoever your avatar is at that time. But when we get to that point where we're like, okay, I, I genuinely ask if they're not first time home buyers, hey, has anyone ever taken the time to sit down with you and explain how we as agents are compensated? 
And typically they say, well, no, not really. And so that's where I hit it. I was like, okay, well, let, and I explain exactly how it works. And then I say, and so if you're comfortable with it and, you know, you think that I'm the agent for you, we actually official have you officially hire us. And this is the paper that officially hires you. So it's a decision that needs to be made. And then they say, oh, okay. And then I walk them through what that buyer broker says. Yo, real quick. This podcast is not free. Cost of admission is sharing with a buddy who'd benefit or throwing it on your Instagram story. I guess we'll reshare that shit. I was going to ask you're like talking about how you take them through it. Can you like actually take, cause you're like, then I explain how it works. Can you actually explain how it works and give your, okay, this is what it looks like. And then talk about if you're comfortable with that. Do, can you do the whole thing? Role play. Yeah, baby. Role play. yeah absolutely. <laughs> okay. So I just roll through it like this uh, and I say, okay, so no one's ever tell, told you how we get compensated. I actually work for X amount, right? And I tell them right off the bat, this is what I work for X amount. I say, and typically, wait, how much is that? Offer- is that two and a half percent? Is that three? Or is it like 10 grand? What is the, I actually work for what amount? I actually work for 3%. That's my, that's my charge. I work for 3%. And with that, typically sellers will offer a co-op fee which is the percentage of the 3% you're hiring me for. So a lot of times it will cover it. And I say, but sometimes we're going to run into issues where the seller may not offer a co-op at all, or there might be a difference in the co-op. So I'll say, for example, there's a two and a half percent. And I say, I will always let you know when we walk into a property, if there is a difference between what the seller is offering you and what you agreed to hire me for. So that way you're aware of that right away. And then I also say, so this buyer broker is not only you agreeing to pay me this, but it is also saying that it gives me power to be able to negotiate that if the seller, if there's a difference in that. So that way I can go back to the listing agent and try to negotiate the co-op fee so it doesn't have to come up out of their pocket. And ultimately, if we can't get either of those done, you would be responsible for whatever would be left over. Okay. And then what if they say, so... It, is it true that if we work with another buyer's agent that maybe that they work for less than 3% that I would be able to buy that ho- that one house that we like that isn't offering a buyer's agent uh, compensation? Could I just use another agent then? Yeah, I mean, I would tell them, yeah, you can. Every agent is different and they charge different amounts. And so it's just, every agent runs their business as they please and they get to choose of what they work for. And so this is what I work for and other agents can choose what they want to work for. So at the end of the day, if you would rather go somewhere, feel comfortable with an agent that is cheaper than me, that is definitely up to you. I like, I I really admire when agents have like during their presentation or during their just like interactions with clients that they're themselves, you know, and it comes with, it comes with time and it comes with practice, but like not a lot of, it sounds so obvious, but not a lot of agents are actually themselves with their clients. And you, Kendra, are, you know, like you are, you are you, whether you're having, you're hosting us at like for your barbecues or you're with a client. And the the transparency, the the congruency of like you being you goes a long way. What, how would you advise agents that like don't yet, they have like a work life, you know, a work personality and they have their friend personality. What, what would you tell that agent? I would say you have to figure you have to figure that out because people will eventually figure you out if you're not being who you really are. If you're trying to put on this persona, it, it's not going to work. And if you just have this work side of you and then you have this other personality of you, but you're not sharing it, it doesn't make you special. It just makes you like every other robot agent out there. And that's where the connection comes in is the the Kendra barbecue friendly person. That's why people work with me. It's my knowledge, of course, and my value, but they're typically bonding with you because you're showing them who they are and they want to be around that, right? And so if you don't have that, then why would they choose you? Unless you're some like crazy badass agent who gets things done and you're just like, they, you have this reputation of you're going to get them a deal. People don't want that. They want, they want that connection. And I think that's the other thing that I found in real estate, especially since COVID, is that I think our relationships in general are so hard because everything's so computer and technology that when people go out to show houses with you, 
they want to really connect with you. They really want you to listen to them. It's because they don't get people listening to them often. So you become that person. So you really need to give them that time and that attention. And it goes a long way because I think people these days are just really begging for human interaction. Dude, I totally agree. I think just to loop it back real quick. So by the time I doubt, I really doubt that you get asked too often, you know, hey, another agent could probably do it for cheaper because you've probably set them up with the value proposition so well, because you mentioned that a couple of times. So could mm-hmm. you, because I know that's something that agents are listening. One of the reasons why they're scared is because they feel like they don't even know if they can justify their value. Like they don't even, they're like, oh, should, am I really worth that 3%? So what, what do you think? I mean, what is your value proposition? If, if you have a thing that you're a well-oiled machine saying, do you, what is your value proposition? I think it's my experience. So I think it's my experience and the amount of real estate I've done in such a short time. But I also think that it's really a confidence thing. It really, it really is that fake it till you make it. And I really learned that when I started as that lead agent at Redfin, when they just kind of threw you in and they were like, here you go, here's your clients, figure it out. And you get these people who are just like, Oh, okay. And they, they don't know you're new. They don't know you're new. So if you don't know an answer to a question, you can finesse it in a way where you're like, you know, I'm not sure, but let me, I just want to make sure on that and I'll follow up with you. If you can do that, you're fine. It's really, to be honest with you, I think real estate in general is just confidence and just being like, Hey, I got you. Even if you don't know something, if you're really willing to take care of them, you'll be fine. You just have to let them know. I got you. That's it. It, I, I really don't think it's an overcomplicated process, but I think us as agents are just in our heads. And I think that a lot of agents too are like, hey, like I have this person in front of me and I need to eat. They're kind of like at the feast or famine type feeling. And I think that's where you got to get out of that mindset and just look at it as another day. And when you act like it's another day and it's another client, they tend to be like, oh, okay. Versus, oh my God, I have to have it. Because it's just like anything I say, like when you hold on to something too tightly, it wasn't meant to be in the first place. So you really have to believe that mantra. And that's super similar to those, like those texts that we get from strangers being like, I'm outside the property right now. I'm really in a place and offer. No, it sounds so good. No, you're not. Or if you do place an offer, you're going to back out. You know, like it's anything that sounds too good to be true is just too fucking good to be true. Hey. Kendra, I want to go to what your like five-year goal is, 10-year. What is your overall goal as a realtor? Or are you going to step out of the business at some point? What does the future look like for you? So right now, my five-year goal is to eventually have a team. I don't want a big team, but I do want a couple agents on my team because my ultimate goal is to live in Hawaii at least part-time in my life. That is buy a house there and live there half part time. So I want to be able to do that and still have my business and people here that I trust that are running it while I'm over there. I haven't decided if I want to do real estate in Hawaii, kind of, but that part I know here, at least in Tucson, I want a team so that way I can do that. So that's kind of my five-year plan. 10-year plan, to be honest with you, I hope I'm retired by then. I really do. I hope I'm retired and living in Hawaii and maybe I work at a surf shop twice a week. That's the dream. (laughs) <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. And and yeah, it definitely starts with picking and choosing the right people for your team that you can trust. So that way you can spend time in Hawaii or time wherever the hell you want to spend time. Absolutely. Um, that takes that takes a long time. What what type of people, agents, are you are you looking for? This is again, this is like in the future, but maybe if your five year goal becomes a two year goal, you know. Maybe you can make that sooner. Um, one, you have to have personality. You have to be fun. I think that's the most important because I'm very fun and I'm just kind of like, I don't know, loosey goosey. I mean, I know my shit, but I also want to have fun in the process. So I need people like that. And then I also just need people who just get shit done. That's just the hardest thing to find people. Like you ask them to do something and they just don't do it. And I, I'm such a person too that is if you ask me to do something and you clearly tell me what you want to do, I will do it like in a second. 
I'm very, it's very hard for me to find things to do. That's very hard for me. So if I can just find people who will do things, go out and do it, that that's what I need. Somebody who has personality and somebody who's willing to just do the work because it's not that hard. Have you ever done the disc assessment? No, I haven't. Oh, Should I? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you homework. <laughs> After that, I'm curious. I feel like you're like a like a DI personality because it gets it done, but also like people and Lisa Casey and the, yeah. Anyway, we'll see. Our listeners are dying I, to know so what. Go on. I think. Well, I I actually am interested too. And the D always confuses me because I am so get shit done, but the lowest I score is the D. It's I mean, so the D is like a, maybe like a one. It's Allie, so we gotta read. Get, we gotta read. That's you. <laughs> I do. I take it every year. And it's too. always like, that low, yeah. dude. What the fuck? That's it's so weird. It's always that low. And like the A type personality with the B type, I am a B type personality. You can still get shit done without get, having a stick up your ass. Okay, the a, I'm B, a, is, fuck you. Know, I'm an A type personality. <laughs> We're gonna fight. Get that stick out of your ass. <laughs> I like it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love it. Apple listeners, this short pause is to ask you for a review. Here's how to do it. Back out of the specific episode, go to the page where you see all the episodes, scroll down, keep scrolling. Perfect. Now tap those five stars. Thank you so much. Back to the show. Kendra, is there anything that we missed before we go to our wrap up questions? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I was really excited about my golden nugget because I really hope that helps people, especially with everything going on right now. So I really hope that helps agents and their business be confident with that because you're going to need it. Dude, it's it's badass. Like it's very step by step, which Ali and I are both obsessed with anything checklist. It's our jam. So reading over this, it's going to be very helpful. You're right. Just exactly looking ahead into the summer time frame. So just a reminder, everyone go to theagentgoldmine.com for your free golden nugget courtesy of Kendra. And now Kendra, we're heading to the wrap up. Wrap up question number one. What is your favorite app or tool? Favorite app or tool? Ooh, okay. I would say my follow up boss. That's my tool right now. That's my go to for everything. If I don't have a follow up boss, then I would be in trouble. So very disorganized in my brain. So follow up boss keeps me organized. What what's your favorite? This is a kind of a, an extra question. What's your favorite book or podcast? My favorite podcast is definitely Trading Secrets with Jason Carter. That is my favorite because he has so what's that about? many different people. What is it? Money and finances, actually, and like how people build their businesses. And he really wants to know like how they spend their money. And I just love that. And so he has all kinds of people. He was from The Bachelor, I think. Yeah. So, but he'll have like bachelor people on there. I mean, he's had Barbara, what's her, Barbara Cochran on there. He has cr like crazy people you would know on there, random. So all different kinds of industries. He's had real estate people on there, like Maurizio from the agency. He's had, I think he's had Flag on there. Maybe the other Josh, but yeah, I just think that podcast is interesting because it's always different types of businesses and people and how they make their money. And I'm kind of obsessed with that. So I love it. Dope. What events are you going to in the next 12 months? Uh, so I don't have any out-of-state events. They're more in-state events. So I have my broker owner of the brokerage. He does a lot of speaking events. So I'm signed up for a couple of those this year. But I don't have anything like super exciting this year. Maybe next year. What's his name real quick? <laughs> Blake Clark. <laughs> you're all like oh he's talking a lot but i don't have it I'm, I'm going but i don't have anything exciting on the calendar <laughs> oh, well yeah like i mean you know like the Totten Ferry events or like the big <laughs> all those big events that i probably should go to once in a while but i just don't have any of those planned yeah. maybe next year yeah how can we like shelby and i and the audience help you in your business follow me on instagram because i'm trying to hit a thousand followers so that would be like super helpful and i really want to hit that thousand and drop it because the next question is where can people find you at kendra haro k-e-n-d-r-a-h-a-r-o underscore come check it Hell out Hell yeah a lot of real yes. estate a lot of women's basketball a lot of hawaii that's pretty much what you're going to see on that instagram <laughs> And a lot of good tips. You you have a lot of good tips and it's it's more than just like the beginner level stuff. So I really, really like the content that you're putting out. Thank You'll you. definitely hit. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, 
so Kendra Haro with an underscore. We're also Allie the Agent, The Shelby Show. If you haven't subscribed to us on YouTube, do so. Drop all the comments. We respond to every single one. Share this episode with a friend that is in the buyer's market, that has buyers as clients, that wants to better and increase their game when it comes to getting that buyer broker signed. And hope this helps. Be a bro and share this show. Thanks so much for listening, dude. If you want the golden nugget that this guest provided, see the show notes or just go straight to theagentgoldmine.com. That's where we keep all our resources for you. Till next time.